Hi, welcome to South Metro's Safety. Um, I am Anita Kitch, I'm the Executive Director of FOA. Um, Steve will not be with us this morning due to Veterans Day, and I would like to express um, thanks to all the veterans out there today. Um, really appreciate you for all your service. Um, we're talking today about um, the safety of addiction and what purpose FOA serves in that. Um, why do we have FOA? Um, actually, last night we celebrated our, our eighth birthday. Our founder, Lori Arian, um, started FOA when she discovered her daughter at the time was 17, um, went to, took her to the doctor and the doctor wanted to do blood work and she rolled up her sleeve and realized there was track marks on her daughter's arm. And Lori at that point was devastated. She didn't know how to handle this, um, that her daughter was shooting up heroin. So Lori started talking to her daughter, you know, why she was doing what she was doing and discovered that um, she really didn't have control over why she was shooting up heroin, that it was like a craving she was having that was telling her she needed to get this drug and that her brain was just not functioning without this drug at that point. And Lori was wondering, you know, if other parents realized this and also she was finding that she didn't have the support to be able to talk to people to friends to family that she felt very isolated in this problem that people really didn't want to hear about this so um, eight years ago she put in the Dayton Daily News a small ad asking um, for parents that might have loved ones going through or family members who might have loved ones going through addiction um, to meet up at the YMCA in Huber Heights, and that's when FOA was founded. And they joked that they were founded in a small classroom with a pack of Twizzlers is how they started. Anyhow, from there, FOA has grown over the last eight years. We serve approximately uh, 3,000 people across the area. We do have four sites. We have one in Van Wert. We have one in Tri-County, which consumes of dark. Miami and Shelby County, and they have their meetings in Sydney, Ohio. We have a Clark County site, but the main site is here in Dayton, Ohio, and we operate out of the Life Enrichment Center. So why is FOA important? Well, it's important because stigma is a large part of addiction. As I said, Lori felt that she didn't have family, she didn't have anybody to discuss this with. And FOA is part of that. Um, what we really, really do is families, people in recovery, and I say recovery because we've had people that's not used for an hour show up at meetings. So we are there to meet anybody where they're at in this addiction journey. And as we call it, it's an addiction roller coaster. It's, it's a roller coaster that family never gets off of because there's always that worry of people relapsing or what's going to happen next. So it's an up and down battle for a person's life. But coming to FOA, um, you have somebody there that's been at that part of the journey that can, you can talk with. It might be that your person you just found out is an addict and you don't know what to do, where to turn to, where to get help for them. Our families have all gone through that. You might have somebody that, you know, I don't know where my loved one is. We have families that have gone through that part of the journey. It might be that you've lost your loved one to addiction, and we have people who have lost their loved ones in the addiction process. So we have family that has been through every part, so you have that support there, as well as you know you have individuals who have that are the addicts there in the meeting, all discussing what their journeys have been. What FOA um, can do for a company is that we provide a number of services. FOA has our new service that we started during um, COVID was our 844 number. And the number is 844-2362. And what this is, is anybody um, that has an addiction issue. And I say addiction, but I mean alcohol or um, drug addiction can text that number. And when you text that number, uh, an instant screen will come over to you, just asking basic name, phone number. And one of our family members or person in recovery 
It could be me. What we do is we'll text back and ask if you want to continue communicating through text or if you want to commu communicate by a phone call. And it doesn't matter to us which way you choose to communicate. What we do at that point is that we um, start communicating and find out what your need is. And I'm just going to give some examples from when I have manned the platform as to what kind of questions we're able to answer. Um, I've had one person phoned, um, wanted a phone call, and when I called him back, it was actually the person in addiction that answered the phone. The um, parent that had texted was had stepped out of the room and the person, as I said, in active addiction, answered the phone and was actively using meth, in which at that point she was screaming and yelling and pretty much out of control. And come to find out, this was a young lady in her early 20s that had been to eight treatment centers already and felt she had burned her bridges at these treatment centers and never successfully completed a program and her parents were kicking her out of the house. They, sh and she was freaking out that she couldn't live out on the street. She didn't know where to go, and which I asked her if she wanted to try another treatment center. And what FOA did was we were kind of the connector to get her into a treatment center that she didn't feel she had burned her bridges, and she went through the program then. Another one was I had a father that called, and his thing was he had raised four children. And he said he always felt that he was the cool father that his kids could come to and tell him, you know, what was going on, regardless if it was something he agreed with or not. He said, you know, he always tried to work through problems and issues with his children as they were growing up. But his son had come to the house one day and um, had told him that he had been actively using heroin for about a year at this point. And this father said he was ready to come out of his skin and he felt like he had failed as a parent, that he wasn't the cool parent he always thought he was and wasn't sure how to handle that. And I spent approximately an hour on the phone talking to him and making him realize it wasn't a failure of him as a parent. It was a decision from his adult son had made on his own. And we walked through possible, you know, how he can help his son, how he can be supportive of his son, and that was that case. We've had other cases of um, somebody else called, their daughter was in recovery and had been for about a year at this point, and suddenly this person realized that the drugs had really affected their daughter's mind and that she was, they felt putting some, the grandchildren at risk and they were wanting to go get some temporary guardianship, but they needed a psych eval on their daughter. So we were able to supply that person with a um, list of local psychologists that do drug evaluations for courts so that they could get an evaluation to be able to go into court and get temporary custody of the children. So these are kind of things that, you know, businesses could call in or an individual can call in um, as I said, texted originally, and ask questions like this to get help and support to people. FOA has always considered themselves as a big connector. So we have um, Excel spreadsheets from treatment centers that take different insurances to, as I said, people who can do psych evaluations. Oh, we need a good attorney. My loved one's been arrested for drugs. We can connect those kind of services to people who have the need for them. The other thing that FOA does is we provide weekly support meetings. Um, these have been highly, highly attended prior to COVID. We were averaging 80 to 100 people every Wednesday night at our Dayton meeting. With that being said, COVID has really done a number on the addiction world, and I'm going to give numbers here in a little bit. But um, our meetings then end up having to go Zoom. Well, part of FOA's mission is to educate, empower, and embrace. When you're doing a Zoom meeting and you have the parent who doesn't know where their loved one is, if they're dead in an alley somewhere, um, it's very hard to embrace someone when you're on a Zoom meeting. So it kind of took the appeal of FOA away, um, COVID did. And so now we're working our way back in and we're only averaging about, uh, 30 to 40 people per meeting. 
and we're hoping that builds back up because the numbers of um, overdose deaths in our county are rising and as I said we'll talk about that here in a few. Um, so we have these weekly support meetings and we bring in speakers. It could be um, speakers that are psychologists talking about, um, like next week our speaker is Karen Burr who's duly licensed in mental health and addiction and she'll be speaking about, you know, how to get through the holidays, stress factors, you know, when somebody's in addiction or in recovery and how to get through the holidays to build back up the family connections again. Um, it could be um, somebody talking about, for instance, um, last week we had somebody talking about recovery homes and how to get your individual into a recovery home. Um, so the, the topics are wide as to what we bring speakers in, or it could just be a meeting that we do an open discussion. And um, it could be on, you know, gratitude or, you know, how, how addiction has affected your family. Um, it could be a large number of topics that we have open discussions. Um, one of the most powerful ones we had recently was somebody who had recently got out of um, actually prison for their addiction, um, had applied for a medical marijuana card and got it on PTSD. And whether that should be a clear sign that that's a you know, gateway to using drugs again. So that was another open discussion that we had. So there's a large number of topics that we, you know, have covered at our FOA meetings. And they're run the same way, regardless if you go to Dayton, Van Wert, uh, the Tri-County, or Springfield. So that's another service we offer. Um, another thing we do is outreach. Um, prior to COVID in 2019, we did 230 outreach events and this could be going into the jails into treatment centers um, it could be going to health fairs it, it the our outreach we went into schools and we talked about addiction into schools and provided supports for people because of the stigma that addiction has a lot of times um, you know going into these health fairs that's when you or into schools or into as i said the number of places we went when you start talking about that, you, you almost always get that person or two that in private comes to you and says, you know, hey, my, my parent's an addict and I really, you know, like to talk to somebody. And um, because they really can't talk to their classmates or their um, the other family. A lot of times, um, you know, people don't want to hear about addiction. They think it's a moral failing of an individual and it's your problem, I don't wanna deal with it. Um, the story I love telling and it's a video on the FOA website is um, the, the family who runs our FOA site in Springfield, he is a school superintendent and at our 2019 rally, um, he was working it and this young girl that was 10 years old came up and was asked, you know, well, why are you here? And he, um, he explained to the, the girl how his daughter, you know, at the time was an addict. She is now in recovery and doing well. But, you know, he explained this to this 10-year-old girl. And she goes, well, my dad's an addict. And, and they then was able to form this bond and connection that he, you know, checked on her frequently to make sure she was okay and that she was doing well and any questions she might have he was able to you know help her get through this and it just kind of created this bond that was never there until she realized that she was not the only family going through what she was going through so um, that's another aspect that foa does um, our annual rally our rally was started by once again Lori arian we have had eight rallies now but it's got many purposes to it. One being that we're trying to reduce the stigma. We feel that people would be more likely to go get help and assistance if, um, you know, it's more openly discussed and it's not the thing that you hide in your closet of, oh, I have this son or daughter and they have an addiction and let's just put them away. We can't talk about it to anybody. We want to be open and let people know. There was a movie that um, started that actually was the reason why Lori ended up starting the rally. And it's called Anonymous People. Um, highly recommend watching it. 
but it talks about how over 25 million Americans have an addiction issue and that if all of them started talking about their addiction, how much help and support that they could be for each other, um, if they just, people were able to openly talk about it. But part of the reason people openly can't talk about it is, well, one, as I said, it's kind of the hidden thing in the closet, but number two is it's often aligned and oftentimes if somebody has an addiction issue, it's co-occurring that there's also a mental health condition with it. And people don't like talking about mental health issues. So therefore, um, we, we want, this to be an open dialogue. So we're in the middle of Courthouse Square in Dayton every, it's always the last Sunday of August. And we have over 3,000 people in attendance and people talk about addiction. And we have speakers and we have um, this past rally, we had 68 resources for people to be able to go get help, whether it be um, you know through the courts, whether it be um, outpatient treatment centers, inpatient treatment centers. The resources were endless. Um, we had J.D. Vance talk about Hillbilly Elegy and his family, about you know even how somebody who really had addiction their entire life, he goes to um, law school at Harvard, and still, even in hall, uh, law school in Harvard, he was still having to actively deal with his mom's addiction. So, we have that um, rally, The also the main part of the rally that is just very moving is we have a sobriety countdown. And we start seeing anybody with 50 plus years of addiction that's been in recovery from their addiction, please come front and center. And we always have one or two that's had 50 plus years of being in recovery. And then we count down to 40 and 30, down to you only have an hour. and we could do what's called a big picture and it's all the people who are in recovery and it's very moving it's very um inspiring because we want people to realize that you can recover from addiction it's not easy but you can recover from addiction and we want to stress that point at our rallies um so those are the services that foa is known for what we can do to help businesses we are willing to come into a business and do a lunch and learn and let people know. We have gotten um, a few FOA members by doing our lunch and learns. We have one father who um, actually just last night talked about FOA coming into his business um, that he worked at and did a lunch and learn and he had kept quiet to his business all this time, not telling them that his daughter had been in addiction for a number of years. and that's when he found his support for FOA and has been coming for five years. Um, unfortunately, his story did not end well as his daughter did overdose and die this past um, July. But he's still actively coming for that support and comfort and learning more about what she had gone through. So we can come in and do lunch and learns if you don't want to have that done. We are more than willing to drop off materials about FOA, about addiction. Um, as I said, any employer is able to call into our 844 number um, and you know get advice or get support for an employee that might be going through that. Um, a few little things I wanted to go over today is signs that somebody is addicted if you're an employer. Um, physical signs are lethargic, um, often bloodshot eyes, irregular sleeping, um, also, a sudden weight loss could be another sign. Um, behavioral signs are their so social social circuits kind of shift. Um, at work, they might become more um, secluded from other people, not really wanting to be around others. Um, poor performance. Suddenly, your star star employee is suddenly probably your worst employee. Um, taking off a lot of time, um, being late for work, those kind of things are a sign that there is a problem. Um, neglecting responsibilities. Um, oftentimes they become very self-centered, not um, 
not really looking at the broad picture of what needs to be done. Um, psychological things are they become more paranoid. Um, they also, their self-image um, actually makes a big turn. Um, they, they suddenly maybe, you know, if you had somebody who was always on top of it and wanted to be your star employee, suddenly their self-image is like they're not worth anything. With that being said though, you need to understand the family aspect of having a loved one in addiction. Because when I was going through these signs, um, putting this together, I also realized that this also could be a family member that they're not actively in addiction, but they have a loved one in addiction. Having a loved one in addiction um, also could be the same things. And listening to parents, oftentimes there's sleepless nights. Um, when your loved one's in active addiction and you're not sure you know, where they're at, um, I've heard parents say that they can't tell you how many nights that they really didn't sleep. So you could have an employee that's very lethargic on the job or acts like they don't have sleep and it could be that they don't have the addiction problem. It could be that they have a loved one that has the addiction problem. Um, oftentimes, as I said, taking off work or not being at work. If you have um, a loved one in addiction, it takes a lot out of the family even once they're in recovery because oftentimes there might be um, court court dates that the individual needs to go to or probation. If they're in treatment, especially outpatient, oftentimes they've lost their license so they're not driving. So the loved ones are then having to take off work to take their individual for um, counseling. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of family support that's needed once somebody does even get in recovery that could turn them into maybe not, not so much the best employee anymore. What you can do as an employer is provide them the support, um, promote FOA, promote other avenues. Um, FOA does, they often advocated, FOA does, that we will support anybody who finds a means to get the help they needed. So provide them that support, that comfort, um, Give them an outlet to be able to talk about the addiction issue. If it's, an, if it's an individual that has the addiction issue and you're the employer, um, provide them treatment. Also with the treatment, um, as I said, oftentimes there's mental health issues. Um, make sure that they're getting the addiction treatment and possibly mental health treatment. Um, a lot of places don't do both, so it might be a matter of going to two different avenues for this. Um, if they can find one that does both mental health and addiction, that's great. But um, as I said, make sure that you're being supportive of both avenues. I have found that a lot of people, um, their addiction spurs from childhood trauma of some sort, and it might not be the parents um, caused the childhood trauma. Um, it could be something that's happened in school or something that, you know, they've witnessed that they just never shared with the parents that has caused this trauma that they have not resolved yet that has led to this addiction problem. Um, so make sure you, they're getting both of those um, resources. So also, um, as I said, um, provide different supports there at the workplace. Also offer encouragement. Um, often sometimes people who are in recovery, especially if they've come back to your employment after being in treatment, oftentimes have a low self-esteem. They feel that they've, you know, they, they aren't worth anything. They don't value themselves. So be supportive, um, show them encouragement and value. And, um, and that way that they aren't as, aren't as apt to possibly relapse by, you know, giving them that support. Also, um, just to let you know, just some numbers here around, um, Montgomery County got hit heavy in 2017. 
There was 566 deaths in Montgomery County from overdoses in 2017, and we were deemed the capital of overdoses here in this country. Um, you know, when you average that out, we were having an overdose every, you know, about every 17 hours, somebody was overdosing in Montgomery County. Um, it had become so bad, my husband and I had taken a trip out to Las Vegas and we were waiting in to get into a comedy show. And the guy asked me, you know, oh, so you guys are from Vegas? And my response was, oh no, we're from Dayton, Ohio. And instantly without thinking, he goes, oh, it's the fentanyl capital of the world. And I was just shocked that, you know, I'm used to saying, oh, we're where, you know, the Wright brothers came from, or, you know, NCR was started here, National Cash Register. Um, and I was very, you know, saddened that we had turned to being, you know, known for our drugs. And the man proceeded to tell me that people, he knows people when they needed a good fix, that they would make sure to come to Dayton to get their fix. And that to me is just really sad that that's what our area is known for. Um, a lot of services after 2017 um, started coming into this area. So there's a lot of treatment center options. There's a lot of mental health options. Um, we have organizations called COAT, where it's a group of us that get together from different aspects of um, addiction that get together and you know talk about education, talk about treatment, talk about um, prevention whatever's needed, um, you know, we have an aspect through code that we do it. Also, the Sheriff's Office has a drug-free coalition that we discuss different things that's going on. Um, last night on the news, there was a number that was thrown out um, by the Sheriff's Office that last year they had obtained 20,000 grams of fentanyl in this area. Already this year, and we still have basically two months left, they have obtained 51,000 grams of fentanyl. Um, that's enough to kill the whole population of the state of Ohio. Um, fentanyl is a big thing right now that they're pressing into pills. They are tainting marijuana. They, the, drug, the drug lords out there are not caring. They don't care about the people that they're selling to. Um, and they're, they're killing off our population. Um, going back to the numbers, in 2018, the numbers went down to 273 deaths. 19, it went up to 293. Last year, they jumped up to 323 deaths. COVID was not kind for people in addiction. Um, giving stimulus checks to people newly in recovery and not really having their feet on the ground study and giving them a sudden chunk of money. We were finding a lot of people taking that money and buying drugs and not able to um, use the amount of drugs they had been using before they got treatment and just jumping back in and overdosing and dying. As well as COVID wasn't kind for secluding people and um, recovery need the support groups. They need to be able to be around people. They need to be accountable for their, um, for their actions. And that's really hard when you're secluding people. So they were often relapsing and oftentimes overdosing last year, as I said, 323 deaths last year. What's alarming though is this year, as of June 30th, um, we have had 199 deaths from overdoses. So if you multiply that out, we're looking at possibly 400 deaths this year from drug overdoses, which is very alarming that we are getting back up to those numbers. Um, you know, we're not wanting to get up to the numbers we had in 2017, but we're heading back in that direction. And so that has to be a very alarming tell telltale sign for this area that we need to do more about the addiction problem. We are losing a whole lot of loved ones. Um, a whole lot of employers are losing their workforce. Um, I was talking to somebody last month that <clears throat> he had an employee he had no idea was using drugs, none whatsoever. And um, they all left one evening after work, locked up, and he said that one of his employees who had keys to the building realized he had left something at the office. 
and it had only been about a five minute drive away and he turned his car around and came back and here was one of the employees had overdosed and was laying on the hood of his car and they called 911 and he did not die. They were able to Narcan him back, but they had no clue that this man had been a drug addict and here he had overdosed and if this guy had not turned around and came back to work, this guy would have been one of the statistics I'm talking about. So um, that is something else that you can do as an employer, keep Narcan around, it is free. Project Dawn can um, direct you to an online training. They were doing in-person training. COVID has got them to do online. Or you can call us at FOA. We can supply you with Narcan and it'll have instructions as to how to administer that. And, um, you know, have that at work. Also, you know, it might be a customer that comes in. Um, for instance, one of our people in long-term recovery, she had told me a few weeks ago that she, at her work, she works at a car drive-through, that somebody, when she went to their window, they were shooting up in their vehicle. And I asked her if it triggered her for her addiction, and she said it did not, but she said she was just, you know, going through her head. Do we have Narcan here at work? What can I do if they come through the drive-through? And, you know, suddenly they're unconscious. You know, what do I need to do and following those steps? So um, if you're interested in getting Narcan, please reach out to, as I said, Project Dawn or contact me at FOA and I can make those arrangements to get Narcan to your facility. Also, um, public health is putting um, um, boxes into employers and doing a training. If you'd be interested in getting a Narcan box, it's a locked up box that you would keep like in your office. As I said, if you own a restaurant or if you own um, the drive-through or whatever else, you never know when the customer might be the one, not your employee, um, that your staff knows what to do and how to administer this to save somebody's life. And um, that's important because not only are you saving a life, you're saving a family. Each person that has a drug addiction has a family. And that's what has kept me and has drawn me to FOA is, um, you know, all of us have our, our black sheep person in our family that's kind of the outcast. But the thing is, you still love that person and you still value them and they're still a member of your family. And so this addiction problem really is something that people need to understand is, as I said, it's not a moral failure, but my goal is to have healthy families together and that loved ones aren't burying um, their sons and daughters. So with that being said, you know, please reach out to FOA. Um, we're more than happy, as I said, to come into your business or if you know somebody that might need our support, we are more than happy to give it. As I said, there's been somebody that comes to FOA that would be at the same point as, you know, somebody you might know that needs that support. And we're always good for, you know, a good hug, a good telling you, you know, you can get through this with encouragement and support. And, um, yeah, let's just be a kinder and general, gentle community that realizes that we just need to help each other. And even if it's something that you don't understand, as such as addiction, it is a problem and people do need your kindness and understanding. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate everything and um, please reach out to us.